con Carlos Elizondo. This a conversation Serra. with Carlos Elizondo Mayer Serra. I thank him for joining in, joining us so kindly. We'll know Carlos Elizondo. I will present him. He is a professor at the Public Transformation Government School from the Tech of Monterrey. He has a BA on international relationships and a PhD from the University of Oxford. He has been a researcher at the CIDE Institute as well as an ambassador at the OECD. He's a an political analyst. He writes in paid newspapers. Andres Rosenthal said that the first thing we do every Sunday is read Luis Rubio, Carlos Elizondo. They've been here. And we did not advise our cartoonist uh, Francisco Calderón, who's a lot more fun. But Carlos, we have spoken about Latin America, its post-pandemic uh, reprisal, and we've spoken about the rule of law, competitiveness, equality, governance, security, sustainability. But my question is, How's Latin America and the Caribbean in the face of China and uh, the U.S. and the conflict between these two mammoths? So in this geopolitical landscape, how do you view Latin America? Thank you. I disappoint you. I'm no bottle cap. I leave uh, the uh, interpreters the task to uh, translate that because Ms. Uh, Shane Baum, um, she was going to be invited, and she we should be speaking about something else. But I will start with a proposal. What President Lopez Obrador did in his official visit three weeks ago in Cuba. What did uh, the Mexican president propose to the Cuban minister? A free trade agreement like in the uh, European Union for the whole of Latin America to counter the geopolitical influence of China. Same thing, he, uh, the same topic he raised at the United Nations and the U.S. Nor Brazil, nor Argentina, nor Cuba agreed to that because to these countries, China is their main uh, trade partner, their second investment source. But the first thing we need to know is that Mexico is actually in a different level vis-a-vis -vis of Latin America. Latin America is a natural partner for China because they complement each other in their economies. Mexico and China compete and the access to the manufacturing Mac markets in the world, especially the U.S. So in that context, we need to clearly know that although we have a president that we could easily categorize as a populist, it's a lot more complicated. It's the president that will propose the Union of the Americas, and he sees clearly that the insertion of uh, the North American region is irreversible. He just in, inaugurated a new bridge in Piedras Negras on the borderline with the U.S. So that makes it very, so it's very difficult to have a relationship with Latin America and the rest of Latin America. Uh, it's difficult to understand Mexico to them. Let's have a context. China is becoming decoupled from the world economy. Their exports became 30% of the GDP, and today less than 20, while Mexico's exports are growing in proportion to the GDP. So Mexico has to follow competitiveness to tap on every geopolitical situation. But, and for the rest of Latin America, the dilemma is quite different. The dilemma is how to navigate the ocean to reinforce their uh, comparative assets, uh, sale, selling raw materials, the interests of the region that are clearly very different uh, from Mexico's. 
You speak, uh, you mention the word competitiveness. You are researcher, you are professor. You, let's go into one of the main challenges in Latin America, how to be more competitive. That has to do with science, technology, education, and infrastructure. You've written about these three topics. And here are some data. The Innovation Index 2021, uh, first place, uh, Switzerland, then Sweden, third place, US, fourth, United Kingdom, fourth, South Korea. In the 70s, South Korea was smaller than Mexico. Now, they exceeded everything. Mexico, uh, Chile, numbers 53, Costa Rica, 55, Mexico, 56, and Brazil, 57, although these two countries. Mexico is the 16th uh, economy, Brazil number 11, but we are ranked as 57th, 56th. In the case of research, investment in investigation, uh, research in, in, in Argentina number 41, Salvador uh, point 16, and the only thing that stands out is Brazil with 116. And although uh, patents, uh, patents are created, nothing to do with what other countries do in the statistics, I consulted the first IBM patent, IBM patents. Another is a Korean company. The third uh, patent is a US company. And Mexico doesn't even show there. Latin America is not even included. So how to view Latin America that wants to leave behind the underdevelopment if we do not invest in science, technology, education? Uh, what do we need to do? Is it only about investing money? What, what can we do? Well, as an anecdote, uh, when I was an OECD ambassador, we present every two years the PISA test, uh, where we rank uh, the uh, skills in science, math, and uh, reading from 30, 30 countries, members of the European Union. Well, for the, when I was an ambassador, they would show on the screen. It was a huge uh, screen on one of the walls. And the first thing you saw, uh, that, Mexico's ranking, so I went to the lowest part of the curve, and I breathed in relief because Mexico was not there, but Mexico was outside the screen. It was so, so way down that we couldn't even compete, way, way down in the curve. When we start comparing Mexico with countries of the OECD, Mexico is uh, in the last, uh, occupies the last place, or so one before last. Now. Gurria is here, and the OECD uh, uh, was enlarged. We share with uh, Chile and Colombia worse than us. It's a reality in the region. Why the reality in this region in Latin America? Well, based on the studies of the OECD and the work, uh, the OECD intends to help Mexico. Although we overlooked uh, the problem, not participating in the indicators, uh, when we joined the OECD, we were forced to participate. So this was useful. We had a trend uh, imp improving slightly. However, competitiveness and competition, these are not popular topics. We are countries with great shifts in regard to the public policies. We were leading on education reform based on the principles of improving the skills of the teachers, modernizing the um, subject matters. But now explicitly it is said that we should not seek any competition because that uh, calls for a neoliberal spirit and we need to get in touch with the communities. The first thing is that even if there's a goodwill, Sergio, it's difficult to build that. There are too many created vested interests that militate against that. And if we do not have a national agreement in regard to these topics, what we'll see in the best of cases are 
uh, radical shifts and it's not only about spending money, it's about spending well because the government increased its technology expenditures, but we don't even see more patents. Maybe it was not the right time to do it. The um, Brazil and Mexico spend a lot more in higher education than in basic education. And it's not because of that that we have uh, the best uh, higher education system. Even if we can spend more, it, we won't be able to compete in that area. Now, maybe you did it, did a lot uh, wearing different hats. There are important restrictions when you recruit people, when you hire people to find the right skills, but we also find a great capacity, a willingness of the Mexican worker to learn, to surpass themselves. If you see the workers in the US, it's not only an issue of human capital, but much more complicated security, certainty, infrastructure, uh, economic uh, uh, competitions. So the OECD described it, which one of these topics has not been well diagnosed, and the countries that followed these strategies have improved. But the, the thing is to find the political willingness. So I'll end the question by saying, and something that reflects the spirit of this region in a negative way. I had breakfast with a friend, and she reminded me of something when I came back from Asia and in, in East, uh, in Eastern, East, East Asia. We are amazed by these infrastructure works, airports, and so on and so forth. But it's difficult to imagine another country that's not Mexico, that an airport being in, un, under construction in Texcoco with uh, resulting from 12 years, the result of 12 years of planning was canceled to start a regional, start building a regional airport with no studies regarding the feasibility and we have the combination of power from the president. This is canceled. We start anew, but a total institutional weakness for this uh, construction to pass the filters on how to secure profitability, all things that have to be studied. No study was made, and now permanent damage to the competitiveness of the country because um, the, the airports from Guadalajara and Monterrey depend on the operations of the, the airport in Mexico City. Well, and what raises a red flag is a security. We need to appeal to the basic criterion to guarantee the security of their citizens. If you cannot do it in the operation of your, op, of your airports, well, you have a serious um, you have serious design flaws. Now, in regard to the infrastructure, there's a definition of what an innovation is. To understand the solution to actual problems, we don't need to invent problems to find a solution to them and to develop new knowledge. So this is an innovation. And what does not uh, comply to this definition is no innovation. Now, one of the pillars of innovation is the quality of the infrastructure. Now, the undersecretary has left in Mexico. We do not have a central a planning agency. We had it for a while when we had a unit of investments with uh, Mr. Iriarte, 60s, 70s, where they decided on the major works and they started bickering and quarreling, and now we don't have anything. But we suffer uh, from very mediocre infrastructure quality. The highways in Mexico, the ranking is 407. Singapore, 65, the highest. 
So we are ranked 47th, railroads number 56, ports 65, and in regard to air airports, we rank 84th. And again, Singapore have the highest ranking, and Mexico has 455. Now, in a recent study of the IDB talking about the infrastructure gaps, it is constantly said that we have to invest $2.2 trillion in throughout the region for 2030s, 59% in new infrastructure. We spoke about it in the previous panel with the environmental criteria, but nothing was said about the existing infrastructure that needs to be repaired and maintained. And in, 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 for the Mexican government, maintenance just does not exist. The word just does not exist. So, for instance, look at the subway of Mexico City and Mexico City. Mexico just does not invest in maintenance, and it's not even profitable for a company to maintain a water treatment plant in a small village, a small town, or any small infrastructure. So they just don't know the word maintenance. So these $2.2 trillion represents 12% of the GDP that has to be invested in that. Mexico used to invest up until 2020 around 1.8% around the Latin American average in the projects that are now um, managed by the current administration. But if we really want to close these gaps and be more competitive, we need to seriously work up the, uh, on that. So what about political science and how to tackle this topic on infrastructure to understand that? And with a great advantage of uh, now represent, because infrastructure represents after remittances and, and, and drug dealing, and of course, this is, uh, this represents the highest um, revenues, infrastructure, so we're staying behind in regard to other regions. Ah, oh, so you really want to depress us, no? Nah? And that all the stats, we will always be last, but we're, we always uh, take first place in uh, working hours. But that's the other side of the coin. So infrastructure, about two, three years in the boom of soy in Brazil, the loads of soy bean freights were, were rotten uh, uh, because it's been years they, they've been trying to modernize the Port of Santos. But it has nothing to do with the economy. It has to do with a political will. It's sad that it's changing now. 10, 15 years ago, they've had oodles of money, oodles of money, and they have not been even been able to use the money to fund infrastructure works that should be profitable for anybody who's doing it. The Texcoco Airport had a clear profitability, was very profitable, fine, funded with the payment of services, and the capacity of the airport would be enlarged, and that would pay for the works without talking about the social uh, benefits. That cannot be measured, but it can be measured. We don't have um, a ministry for legacy, Chatham House rules. We don't even have uh, Chatham, Chatham House rules. Uh, this is no Chatham House rules. Ah, oh, well, I, I can still say it because I do not matter. Who cares who I am? Uh, you all know that the thick of all the works undertaken by this administration from the viewpoint of the regul Mexican regulations are totally illegal. In the Ministry of Finance, there is a division that should be validating the economic and social profitability of these works, and there's a division for the environment that should be evaluating the environmental impacts. But they do everything without consulting anything that has to do with science. They just don't have the institutional capacity to do things well. So the tragedy of Mexico and other countries in Latin America well, except Chile, the 
capacity to not only invest the right amounts of money, but to do it in the proper way from the project. Uh, the School of Engineering invited us, and the topic was how much is, would be saved if the works so you start are duly and properly planned. So all these um, works that are undertaken in a hasty manner and the allotment of uh, private resources in a train, maybe we shouldn't even be doing that since Peña Nieto, it was a clear political whim. And I used to say jokingly, one of the advantages of Meade winning the presidency, he would have only been concerned about a little train in San Angel because he wouldn't have had to build one in Toluca or one from Palenque to Tulum, destroying everything. So we live, uh, we live by the whims of the president, and the most emblematic works are tied to presidential whims. The whims planning is zero, planning zero, the costs will go way up exponentially, everything crashes down to the floor. In, before investing, we should strengthen the planning mechanisms. And what really raises great concern, the work is done. What works should the country be implementing from the government, the private sector? In the previous administration, this administration, every 18 months, they announce new rounds of the restructuring program, great investments. But only those that have the uh, political whims behind supporting them will be implemented, even if they're worth nothing and they are good to nobody. So those that are not supported, those that would be good for everyone, nobody is supporting them. Everything's fragmented. <clears throat> the purpose is so fragmented. There's no unit, a national unit. And there's all, always somebody behind hindering everything. There's a new highway to Malinalco, three kilometers from Lerma. Well, it goes around a little town, three that will save us 20 minutes, another three kilometers that would save us 20 minutes, but that cannot be done because of our land tenure rights issues. And so not only planning is important, but you need to build a political pact, a political agreement that the East Asia countries have done it so well. This is an important anchor in the capacity to grow, the willingness to grow and make your economy competitive. This government, well, we should commend this government since uh, the transseismic uh, train has a goal to meet. But since it's done in such a hasty manner, they have destroyed the exclusive economy, economic zones and the probabilities for this to attain a positive goal is close to zero. And all these works will um, entail budget costs that are enormous. So the money available for future investments will be eaten up. The operation of these projects, most likely these operations <coughs> will not be profitable, even discounting the CAPEX. Just the operation of the Felipe Angeles Airport, uh, maybe it'll be eons before they can cost for pay for the operation cost and then the maintenance, the word that does not exist in their dictionary. I spent some time in the independent board at Pemex. And it was so interesting from the point of view of economic policy of all the stakeholders, all, everyone involved in, in the council of Pemex, because a new project is so much more interesting than maintenance. So they're always bringing to the forth these new projects, but there is a decline. And when big events happen, like, like what happened with the, the Mexico City subway, and this is such a complex issue, 
this is such a, an enormous cost in terms of lives even, and in this country, you never find the budget for maintenance. So what do we need to do? We need to bring this to the fore as a national agenda, as a key point for the national agenda, and uh, question our candidates in that sense, and that could generate a certain uh, confluence of the main economic, political, and social forces in the country. Well, uh, I agree that we, we're living through, through a, it's a vicious cycle. The, the political arena is highly polarized throughout Latin America, not only Mexico, and there's no agreement. And given that there's no agreement, governments are inefficient, and they have weak results, as has already been put forth here. And that leads to further fragmentation still. So how to break that vicious cycle? And how, well, this is inexorably, are we doomed to stay there for the coming decades? Is there something to be done? And as you said, well, political parties, or coalitions who bet on a, on, on, agreement as the mechanism for moving forward, that that must be incentivized. Well, doubtless this is true, but perhaps someone from Chile here could correct me or, or perhaps enhance what I will say. But a success case when you have a collective a coalition of political forces that allowed them to have a relatively consistent policy in the past 30 years and which allowed them to develop infrastructure, the high quality infrastructure at speed, at a scale and speed that other countries in Latin America have not. Very soon after President Pinero was boasting on Financial Times that Chile was finally the, con the Latin American country that would make the jump and become a, a, a developed country, there was a social reaction immediately which would lead to, to a constitution that incorporates some, a great many aspects, which, which are interesting, but, but hard to implement a left-leaning precedent, brutal changes in, uh, in, the, in the political class. And no Latin American country has been able to resolve this structural inequality. In the case of Mexico, the, the revolutionary government doled out half of their territory. Half of the, ter of the national territory is owned is owned by communities, and this is not only bad land, there's there great lands. So what, what the uh, revolution accomplished was to destroy uh, the, the oligarchy uh, from the years of Porfirio Diaz. Notwithstanding, things did not truly change because in the 20th century, industrial wealth but there was no mechanism for redistribution of, of wealth there that allowed for a sustainable political structure. And that is what happened in Chile. And an inequality report for the world that came out two months ago. It's very interesting. You see these charts where you can tell how well, you have the, 50, the, the, the poorest countries, 50 percent, then the richest countries, the 5 percent of the richest countries. And you can see that Mexico and Spain are very similar in terms of income. They have more assets than we do. They have been accumulating assets for a longer time. But when you look at the 50%, the poorest, the income that we have in, for that same sector is a pittance in comparison to Spain. We have negative assets. We have more liabilities than assets. And the average Mexican has more liabilities than assets. And if you look at all Latin America, it's pretty much the same situation, same thing. In Chile, it's less glaring, but the inequality is among, amongst the highest in Latin America. So we are yet to solve these uh, societal issues in our colonized societies, which at the point of independence created a Creole elite that was the true winner of the wars of independence, and, and even with revolution such as the Mexican Revolution, there's so many mechanisms that perpetuate inequality and the, 
the tools for redistribution in the 20th century in Europe, education systems, health systems, which are efficacious and vast. We have not been able to build out any such systems. So we're trapped in a cycle of, of highly efficient governments that are highly efficient in terms of growth, but who, notwithstanding, at the end of the day, expectations are not met with. And, and, and things crash back to the baseline. In the case of Argentina, there is a permanent back and forth. Governments that try to stabilize macroeconomic indicators, but there's a cost, and then people try to stabilize costs, but it's not sustainable at the macro level. So, so many models that there's an ongoing tension. And this leads to the question of how to make your societies more just. I believe that this begins with uh, the creation of more efficacious education and health systems and, and, and public safety. As for business people, when they speak of governance, they don't only uh, mean uh, uh, um, property rights for all, they mean a solution to their conflicts. When you speak of uh, public spending in, in education and health, these are central issues, and they, they're ever more complex in, in the digital world. Digitalization and the capacity to take this on in our day-to-day, -day, which leads, like uh, in turn, to the need for, uh, for ever greater investments in, in terms of resource, not only resources, but also human resources. So the gap grows more and more. So any government that wants to solve this, the question is how to balance their budget and how to invest in these kinds of programs, social programs, which uh, but there's no way to win an election uh, with, with such a stance. You, you, you can't say uh, we will have better primary schools. There's no way. There's no way. And, and now if we will no longer have primary schools. It will be phase one, phase two, phase three, and children will self-evaluate. So the results will be fantastic. Well, another step backwards, which makes the construction of a shared project more difficult still. When we look at the ongoing polarization of politics everywhere throughout the world, when we look that this is not an issue only of, of our local mechanism for political communication when you have a president who dominates um, the stage. Uh, and this is oftentimes built through polarization. And this makes a shared project so much harder, because this polarizing logic, if one part of the electorate is angry because Tescoco was angry, OK, then it is a good, that means it is a good decision to have canceled the airport, because then you have this differentiation across social groups. But then you have a country such as the United States of America, with 70 percent depends on of, of, of issues uh, or decided on by by polling. And what 70 percent of people believe that the, the elections were stolen from Trump. You can see that there's no common base in the, in the democracies 30 years ago. It was hard to envision such a situation. Not for good or evil. We had Jacobo Sarudovsky. We had a single face, one person who had a capacity to inform everybody equally with enough credibility to have a, a generalized agreement of what we should do. And um, this is added to, to what social media has, has been doing in terms of building agreement because uh, social media based uh, built on polarization and the more uh, uh, societies become uh, digitalized the, the deeper the gap will become because everyone is in their own eco chamber so it becomes ever harder to build out uh, a shared discourse i hope that in our elections in 2024 we, we, that we take them on uh, with, with this logic and i believe that the morena candidates are not radical um, the, the mayor here in Mexico City is, is not radical, and her highly effective 
uh, security policy in Mexico City has been great, and the chancellor, the, these people are not polarizing, and hopefully the opposition will be will also move along these lines, and then a bridge may can be built. The worst possible scenario is one such as that of Brazil, where, where, where you got Dilma and then you got Bolsonaro, and that polarization well makes it impossible to build a shared project to solve such issues in the mid and medium and long term. Well, perhaps our friends from Chatham House can um, share their point of view where we can find out what the role of think tanks are. Because we can see their decisions and how information is made available immediately. It's highly liquid. And where beyond that, uh, the strength of an opinion from the think tank is, is diluted via social media. So what do we do as, as, as think tanks to become relevant? And w an opinion from a think tank, we had a white paper, and then it was studied and quoted and so on and so forth. And now I have to type it in 54 characters or whatever Elon Musk decides on tomorrow. I think that this is a topic which is well worth um, thinking about. I, I, I'm guessing you've probably thought about this. So how can society at large uh, take part of these decision-making processes in the face of growing polarization? Well, this is a huge ongoing challenge. When I was a director at CD and then OECD, it was, the world was different back then because these opinions, these uh, well-built opinions had a positive impact on, on the creation of public policy. And oftentimes, of course, there could be mistakes in these proposals and then reality could, uh, would oftentimes force you to modify to, to correct course, but in the creation of public policy based on debate, on informed debate uh, uh, with experts and populist governments, to say this in a word, uh, they are essentially critical of technocracy's merit, it seems to them, are disguised way for the elites to abuse people. So th they, they have called it the tyranny of merit. A very sophisticated professor from Harvard makes some very interesting uh, arguments for, for how merit becomes a way to reproduce privilege because those who can who gain access to Harvard, well, they, they can do so because they have already been through a, a number of, of previous socioeconomic filters. So as public servants, if we're highly qualified and if we have access, then of course, a part of the population may feel that this excludes them. And then the leap that a great many um, politicians make when they say that the ideas of these uh, public servants, well, they, they, are, they have interests. Well, it is, it is not a leap. It is a, a mere step. We have a great many mistakes have been made, you know, for, for good or evil based on certain technical parameters. If you have a, 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 a social program, you had a pilot, then you would modify, you would course correct based on intuitions and the, and the, and the current political currency of, of such projects. So I don't know if, if what people from abroad may, may think, uh, such as are hosts here, but think tanks are oftentimes received not so much as a, as, as a criticism uh, to corruption and impunity, but the, the first papers that they published were criticisms of, 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 of the BRI, the government back then, and then this fed into the campaign of, of candidate Lopez Obrador and the government of Peña Nieto could have seen them as excessively critical, but they did not see them as adversarial who wished to bring him down, whereas the current government is confrontational. 
So it is impossible to have a conversation about public policy, what should be done so as to avoid the, the issues that, 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 that have been identified. So this is a huge challenge for those who wish to um, build the best possible public policies. When you have a government that simply, and by function of having studied, a, people who studied abroad, academics, well, they, they are now, all, they have all of a sudden become suspect. It is a highly complex issue. I have, I have not much else to add. We will open now, we now open up the floor to questions and comments. Ana Paula. Ana Eduardo Ibarrola. Thank you, Sergio. Carlos, I would like to ask you, what do you uh, think of uh, Lopez Obrador and his popularity rate? Some say 60%, some say it is not so high. The presidents have had this this rate. But what 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 is amazing is that this this is this 60% and how polls show that people do not approve of what he's been doing vis-a-vis -vis the economy, security, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Ana Paula. Well, this could be nothing but Chatham House rules by definition, being Ana Paula. I will begin by what you omitted, and then I will go to what you did speak to. Uh, President Calderon's uh, popularity rate was not so different, but the discredit from the opposition that we have to do. We had we had never seen that is n never before seen. So that Paul from Reforma, when you associate corruption and you have political parties 50, 60 percent, they would say pri. Well, then clearly, it is not for granted taken for granted that, that you can make such grave mistakes and and and, and not. Uh, keep campaign promises. So I believe that this is the key difference. It is not so much as popularity. It is the profound discredit from from the power mafia uh, uh, group, as, as the president calls them. And what we have seen in other countries in the world, the last uh, electoral cycle in France, where political parties attack each other, then it becomes very hard to rebuild from there. So in contrast to the past, when, for instance, for, to give an, an extreme example, when President Fox confused the pronunciation of Jorge Luis Borges, and this became a, was a scandal. And we would love for scandals today to be for, 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 for situations like that. And today we can have a much bigger scandal than he, he just insults his critics and, and shuts them up in 30 seconds. So there's been no leadership. We've seen nobody who can take a stance from a, from a different place. This tension has not been resolved. This, this We have seen an ongoing fragmentation of opposition, of the opposition. And this, it's very hard for the opposition to win in Morena. If you see how people have evaluated governors and municipal uh, precedents on average, they, they, they have done worse. But they are the most popular, notwithstanding, in the current political climate. What the reasons are, well, it may be simply that it is a younger political party and the brand is not as worn. So it is, I believe, impossible to understand its popularity without looking at this other aspect. The other, the question about this gap between this sets some context for foreign friends. The president, Lopez Obrador, through polling, so, so, people are asked, do you approve or disapprove? And 60% of Mexicans approve. He started at 80% approval. And starting at the end of his first year, he started oscillating around 60, but his handling of, of well, his corruption, the economy, public policy, there has been a deterioration. So the the gap has uh, broadened. And in Ana Paula, I think that this will depend on 
and how much this gap continues to grow in the coming two years before the coming elections. And it will also depend on whether someone in the opposition is capable of putting together a narrative to say that things can be done in, in a certain specific different way. And that's how I would explain the current situation. Thank you very much, Carlos. Eduardo, please. Eduardo Barrole. Eduardo Ibarrola from Zucumex. It is impossible for me to, to ignore your uh, provocative statements about governance and public security, and I think you're right, because public security is a part, an integral part of, of governance, and this is more thinking out loud than a question, but I think that governance and then it is all encompassing at the end of the day. Rules can yield huge issues in terms of, of, of violence and security if it is not well managed. And this is not only in terms of a great big corporate contracts, but when society cannot, does not find a solution to their everyday problems in life. Whom do you go to when your neighbors do not respect rules? For living together in an apartment building, noise levels in, on the road, and the proliferation of, of alcohol sales on the street, and what this is generating issues uh, between neighbors. And I think that it is very important within the, the context of, the, of, of, of our attempt to recover governance that we begin with civil justice and to create a situation where people can solve their everyday issues. And this will reduce impunity indices, which we know are the, the, the leading trigger in terms of insecurity and public security. The, pr the cost of crime is far too low, and so it continues to grow. And we forget that oftentimes uh, that Mexico is a, is a federal union, and 55% of, of the crimes committed are within the scope of, uh, of the federal states. And this situation does not happen in the federal entities where they oftentimes do not have enough technology to litigate, to investigate in a modern adequate fashion as, for instance, can be done at a federal level yeah. or at the level of, uh, of the highest um, legal authorities. Um, let us take this to the extreme. This topic of governance and this capacity is you put it so well, of, of resolving conflict. This is the issue. A great many years ago, I wrote an article called The Writ of Amparo. And this is a text which attempted to demonstrate how, through the democratization of the country, Lawyers working with, with the biggest firms in the country found a way through the writ of Amparo to postpone payment of taxes because there was a highly favorable interpretation of what the state could and could not do. And before the democratization of our country, the president had enough power to stop uh, writ of Amparo legal processes that could undermine uh, taxation. So corporate lawyers, the big uh, juice companies, found a way to get the money back, the money that they paid in taxes, from, and to simply pocket it. And this was all fully legal. Everyone was happy. The rules were been met with. But these rules were rules with those who had 
the ability to litigate had tilted the rules in their favor. So, of course, they want a state of governance, but they do not want mechanisms for the resolution of conflict that are equally available to all. So, well, as the president said, well, you, you can't complain with this new government. The president said so yesterday. Because now, well, the conflict between a small company and a large company, the large company will always win because they have a greater power to litigate. So conflicts are not, there, there is no common ground for litigation. So this is what we should focus on because if, if conflicts are resolved on equal grounds, then a society will s gradually resolve so many issues that otherwise escalate and lead to uh, further issues. And the topic of public safety it requires a different approach. It's not only a topic of impunity, and you know, it's not only a matter of jailing those who are guilty, but state authorities must become involved in this necessitates midterm investments, which are at the level of, of the investment being made in the airports that are being built. And, and with the federal police, it takes several terms in order to fully build us out so as to disincentivize organized crime from, from doing certain, carrying out certain activities. Thank you so much. Any other comments, questions? Carlos Camacho. I think, Carlos, that this conversation has been fascinating. We have uh, touched on so many topics. But I will ask you, if you were an opposition candidate, what would you do? Beyond not accepting it, beyond not taking it, but what would you do? For the presidency? Yes, for the presidency. For Mexico City, that would be interesting. I hope I am invited next time uh, to, as a candidate uh, for mayor. Now for the presidency, um, well, look, there is a pre-candidate whom I think is, is doing the right work, Enrique de la Madrid. Well, what he's trying to, to do is to generate an ongoing debate on the central topics that the country must resolve to find a way to, to unify at least broad swaths of, of a population. If we agree and if we can agree on what the issues are and what the possible solutions may be, without delving into, into too much detail because public policy is so deeply boring, but at the same time without avoiding certain topics because the challenge fa that, that will face the coming administration is brutal. Lopez, so Lopez Obrador is very good at not promising what people don't want to hear, but starting to find shared ground, commonalities, agreements, and to stop with the personal attacks. That'll be very hard. It's, it'll be very hard to to pierce through the noise in the current information, world of information. It is highly revealing in, in that sense that the possible candidate, the best positioned candidate from the opposition has held one single, he just started his, his first uh, position in, in, in public service ever. He is mayor of Monterrey. And his high, biggest asset is that his father was murdered in 1994. So it is so hard to pierce the noise in this day and age. So what the opposition will likely do is to find an established brand. And this is an interesting, interesting matter. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you, everybody.